So uh, this disease is uh, not uh, rare uh, these days. It's actually common and we've seen many cases, but because of uh, its uh, relevance, Dr. Anman asked me to talk about it again. I gave this lecture a couple of months ago in another conference. And to be honest, I thought uh, this disease is almost behind us because when there was less Corona cases, we didn't see much. And then when the Omicron hit recently, we did not see much patients, but over the last week we have seen a few cases. So maybe we will see again, another wave of uh, MISC uh, coming soon. So we will, I will go over two cases with different outcomes. We will discuss about MISC and diagnosis, presumed pathogenesis and management. Uh, Dr. Walid Abu Hamur will be talking more about uh, pathogenesis and actually genetic predisposition today. So I might not uh, put a lot of emphasis on this today. And I'm gonna have a very quick note about myocarditis in children post uh, messenger RNA COVID vaccines. So the first patient, is a seven month old patient from Indian descent. He presented with three days of fever, rash, and non purulent conjunctivitis, cough, vomiting, and diarrhea. The patient was admitted to a branch uh, hospital and then was transferred to our hospital on day four of fever for possible Kawasaki disease versus post COVID MISC diagnosis. The initial labs, the CRP was uh, moderately elevated at 89. AST and ALT were mildly elevated. Hemoglobin was at the lowest normal limit for age was 11.1. And this is important because you will see in the next slide why these numbers are important. The white cell count was not elevated. The platelets were not elevated. Albumin was normal. And urine, urine analysis showed just mild uh, uh, leukocytes, but without evidence of infection. So our, the patient did not meet uh, full uh, criteria for Kawasaki disease. So we have to think of incomplete Kawasaki versus Miss uh, C. Uh, so when you think about uh, incomplete Kawasaki, you have to look at echocardiogram and at the, at the labs. The echocardiogram was normal. So now thinking about the lab criteria, when the patient does not meet full clinical criteria for Kawasaki, you have to think about incomplete. So the patient did not meet full five days of uh, fever, but we have high suspicion and you can diagnose Kawasaki disease before day five of fever if you have high suspicion. And actually it is associated with worse prognosis. That tells you that when, if you make the diagnosis early that the patient is really sick and had symptoms uh, severe enough to make you think of Kawasaki. Uh, so if the patient has only two or three compatible clinical criteria, or if, the infant, if there is an infant with more seven days of fever without any explanation, then you have to think of incomplete Kawasaki. Then you look at the labs. If there is elevated CRP and ESR, we take all the six labs looking at the lower box there. So if you have three out of six, anemia for age, platelet count more than 150,000 after day seven of fever. So because early in Kawasaki, the first few days, the platelets might not be elevated. Albumin less than three, elevated ALT, white cell count more than 15,000, and urine showing more than 10 WCs. So the patient actually met only two of the six, but because the hemoglobin was almost meeting anemia criteria, we decided to treat this patient as incomplete Kawasaki. The echo was normal. If on the other side, the CRP and the ESR are not elevated, you can follow the patient clinically by echoes or clinically or labs. So the patient not meeting criteria for complete Kawasaki, he barely met the lab criteria for incomplete Kawasaki. Our decision was to treat as Kawasaki anyway, or uh, uh, Messi. So IVIG was given the usual doses, two gram per kilo. Low dose steroids was also added uh, in case this is uh, post COVID. And high dose aspirin was also started. We used to give dose of uh, aspirin 100 milligram per kilo. Now the recommended dose, you can give 30 to 50 milligram per kilo per day divided every six hours. 
Uh, later, during the admission, the patient developed BCG in duration, and this is the patient actually. And this is this is confirms our diagnosis as Kawasaki disease. This is a very sensitive uh, for Kawasaki. Um, also, the patient developed other signs and symptoms. So he had uh, mucous membrane changes and extremities in duration. So we were really happy that we gave the IVIG on day four. Also, unfortunately, later on, it did not make big difference, but we did all we can. So the patient, despite the IVIG, continued to end the steroids and the aspirin, continued to be febrile. So a second IVIG dose was given. A repeat echocardiogram was again normal. There was clinical improvement in the patient's symptoms after the second dose. The fever subsided for almost one day, but low-grade fever reoccurred again after 20 hours. CRP went down just briefly, but then it rose up again the following day. So we are dealing with ongoing inflammation. The patient is not improved yet. So to be honest, I wanted to give the patient infliximab at this point, but um, a discussion with uh, other specialists, the decision was to go with the familiar uh, steroids. So the patient was giving pulse steroids, uh, methylbridnisolone IV, uh, it took 30 milligram per kilo for three days. Repeat echocardiogram, unfortunately, started to show some coronary changes. There is mild right coronary artery dilation. The LCA was not clear, but looked mildly dilated as well. So we started the patient on a second antiplatelet, which is clopidogrel. And despite now after resolution of fever, CRP was still elevated in the 70s. So no more fever, but CRP is still elevated. And if the CRP is still elevated, not going down, you have to continue and inflammation is still going on. So we immediately after three days of uh, steroid, uh, on the fourth day, CRP is still elevated. We gave infliximab. The dose is five milligram per kilo uh, over two hours. Immediately, there was significant drop in the CRP from 155 to 60s. But a repeat echocardiogram, unfortunately, now showed worsening RCA dilation and development of a giant aneurysm of the left coronary artery with the sparing of the arterial os. So at this moment, now we have to add another uh, anticoagulant. So low molecular heparin was added. Some people argue whether you should give heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Heparin is easier to monitor with PTT, but low molecular weight heparin has anti-inflammatory uh, properties. So in general, the recommendation is to give low molecular weight heparin. So this is the echo of the patient. And I just wanna show you. So this is the awake. This is the LCA aneurysm. This is the LCA almost. This is the, the os. This is the LCA os. So you can see the LCA os remained small, but after that there is giant aneurysm. And this leads to bottleneck like stagnation. There's little blood passing through. There is no much flow. And leads, this is, leads to stagnation of blood here. And with the platelets now in the, the patient almost reached 1 million and the white cell counts are very high. This is now even higher risk for thrombosis. So this is color of the image and you can see there's still a lot of flow inside the LCA. There was no thrombus. So despite this, we still have the patient managed with three anticoagulation and the patient was still doing well. Now, the CRP before the infliximab was 155. One day after infliximab, it went down to 66, but then rose again to 78. So after I see it going up again, I'm, I was out of uh, answers, to be honest, and I've never managed a patient up to this degree. So we decided to transfer the patient for plasmapheresis to another hospital. The platelets were almost uh, 1 million and COVID-19 anti-spike antibodies came back positive. Although there was no uh, history of COVID in the family or the patient and they deny exposure, the antibodies came back positive. So this could be a, a possibly like a post-COVID misc. So despite the patient looking completely well, the patient looked fine and afebrile, he continued to have high CRP. 
So we decided to transfer him to get plasmapheresis. Patient, I started him on beta blocker, hoping to prevent further coronary dilation and avoid rupture. The patient was receiving pulse steroids again as temporary measures till he is being transferred. So we started again, methylprednisolone 30 milligram per kilo, waiting for transfer. So the patient was transferred on Monday. The last time I saw the patient was on Sunday. Patient looked good. The echo looked good. It was the images that I showed you, except for the dilation function was still normal. On Monday before transfer, the patient was a bit irritable and the mother was telling my kid is there's something wrong with my kid he's not normal he's crying uh ecg was done was showed q wave and uh literally only v2 and there was a little changes in the st segment but not significant uh the patient got transferred before he got the echo in the first hospital so he got transferred to the second hospital and there, the echocardiogram showed a large LCA thrombus with acute decline in cardiac function. Mechanical revascularization was not an option, so TPA was started without benefit. Unfortunately, the patient had cardiac arrest, but recovered successfully and was placed on ECMO for a few days. This is the ECG of the patient. And I just want to point, if you look at V2 only, there is Q wave. And if you look at V3 and lead three, there is very subtle mild ST segment depression. So how to treat coronary artery thrombosis when it happens? You start TPA because usually mechanical revascularization in children by surgery or cath is very, very difficult. TPA should be given with low dose aspirin and low dose heparin. And once the TPA dose is finished, you should uh, give high, full dose heparin. In very large thrombus burden, it is reasonable to use also other 2B, 3A inhibitors, such as amixibab, which was also given to this patient. Now, the patient, uh, because being on ECMO uh, and with severe LV dysfunction, he developed pulmonary edema. So you have to vent the left ventricle. You have to create an ASD. So he went to the cath lab. Successfully, a stent was placed in the atrial septum to vent the left ventricle. But because of the stent, he developed severe hemolysis and developed severe uh, kidney dysfunction. And I was talking to the nephrologist at the time. And because this, there was uh, Dr. Ayman. So he thought this is a case of HUS, and I was strongly against it. I thought it was hemolysis, not because of HUS, it's actually because of the stent, but the argument was there for a while. The patient ended up uh, with renal failure and was on dialysis surprisingly for three months, but after that recovered, which is I've never seen after three months full recovery. Unfortunately, there's still significant neurological insult during the arrest. There is mild improvement in cardiac function. The patient's still alive, but still moving back and forth between long-term care and hospital care. So this is the first case is, uh, despite all the management, unfortunately not a good outcome. The second case, which is similar to many cases that we have treated, the last of which was actually just on Wednesday, uh, an eight-year-old boy with history of COVID like two months prior, or less than one month prior, two months uh, prior to presentation. In September, October, had tooth abscess and a few days later presented to the hospital with fever, tachycardia, and hypotension. The patient had abdominal pain and vomiting. Due to the tooth abscess, sepsis was suspected, so the patient was given boluses of fluid and was started on inotropes. Patient developed tachypnea and hypoxia, so OptiFlow was initiated. Echocardiogram was done. Actually, it was done to rule out infective endocarditis, but we were really suspecting this is messy. I did not think of myocarditis, of uh, infective endocarditis. It showed dilated left ventricle, mitral regurgitation, and mildly reduced function. The function was around 46 to 47%. So messy was suspected. Further workup was done and treatment initiated. IVIG and methylbedrozone were given. Once the blood pressure was stable, diuresis given, which resulted in quick improvement in the respiratory status. 
aspirin and enoxaparin was started, cardiac function improved quickly and inotropes were weaned. Methylprednisolone was weaned over the next few weeks. Patient did well and discharged from the hospital quickly. Strangely enough, the same patient had COVID infection again with mild symptoms, but no second attack of Missy. Patient discharged from my care now doing very well. And this is the story of other many other patients. So the first patient is and like is a rare case. His age is a risk to be honest, around seven months. It is very high risk of developing long-term complications. But this is the typical presentation that we usually see. Very quick improvement, very quick discharge. So what is Missy? This is the criteria from the CDC because it is in children by definition. So age is less than 21 years. The clinical criteria is minimum 24 hour history of subjective or objective fever more than 38, severe illness necessitating hospitalization and two or more organ system affected, cardiac, renal, respiratory, hematology, gastro, derma, and neurological. There should be laboratory evidence of inflammation and also there should be laboratory or epidemiologic evidence of SARS infection. So either positive SARS testing by PCR, serology or antigen, or COVID exposure within the last four weeks. And there is no alternative diagnosis that you can blame. And this is just a drawing from one of the articles looking at all the, sy the systems and the symptoms that the patient can present with. When you go towards babies, they present more like Kawasaki-like. And when you present towards teenagers, they present more like myocarditis. GI symptoms are very common, diarrhea, abdominal pain. The last patient we saw also had articarial rash, just like present on this patient. The pathogenesis, it will be talked about later in the day by Dr. Abu Hamoud. So I'm not gonna describe it. It's like, uh, in general, it looks like a cytokine, uh, cytokine storm uh, with uh, a lot of cytokine release leading to a hyperimmune reaction affecting all symptoms, uh, systems. Differential diagnosis, Kawasaki disease, Kawasaki disease shock syndrome, toxic shock syndrome, sepsis, and macrophage activation syndrome. These are comparisons of the differential diagnosis to Missy. Uh, I'm not gonna go over it, it's here just for reference. These are the labs that you should consider to make the diagnosis and also work up for differential diagnosis. This is from article, but it's also the same in the Saha protocol. The proposed management, definitely IVIG is the first line. Uh, the, the dose, it should be two gram per kilo. If the patient means, uh, uh, meet criteria for hemophysitic, lymphocytic hemophagocytosis, then you can give a lower dose. Use fluids with caution, aspirin, steroids, and akindra to silizumab. I've never used those, but we have used infliximab. And this is the Saha protocol, very similar. Uh, it goes over how you examine the patient, resuscitation, be careful with fluids, give IVIG, uh, consult the pediatric ICU, and start inotropes. This is how to manage in the pediatric ICU, consult with cardiologists for management of uh, pulmonary edema, doing the echo and follow-up ECGs. So uh, this is the same we have talked about. So I'm finished about Missy now. I'm gonna talk about, uh, in the last few minutes, about myocarditis and COVID vaccine, because this is very important. So myocarditis associated with messenger RNA vaccines like Moderna or uh, Pfizer vaccines. In the age group 12 to 39, the incidence of myocarditis post second dose of messenger RNA is 12.6 to 79 per million. And this is much higher than the incidence of myocarditis in the general population. So there is a clear link between the vaccine and the myocarditis. All patients, almost of them had chest pain, elevated troponin, ECG changes, and had positive findings on MRI. Symptoms usually present after the third uh, or fourth day of a second dose. And almost all patients had recovery with or without treatment. And up to my knowledge, 
in the whole world, there is suspicion only of one or two patients who died from post-vaccine myocarditis. It's not confirmed, but suspected. Now, 80% of the cases are in males, and the highest are among teenagers. And this is looking at uh, the epidemiology of myocarditis post-COVID vaccine. They will tell you the epidemiology of myocarditis expected in the general population, and then the observed after the vaccine. And you can see it is much higher with the vaccine. If you go to the male side, it's even much more pronounced. But again, all these patients recovered very quickly. So I have seen so many patients of myocarditis post COVID, but I have seen only one patient myself, uh, post COVID vaccine patient presented on day four after with just chest pain and ECG changes. The troponin elevation was very mild. We only gave him ibuprofen to be honest. After two days, he was fine. And the ECG changes uh, reverse very quickly. And this just shows you that uh, it is much better to give the vaccine rather than avoiding it. Because if you give the vaccine, you save so many patients from going into the hospital and being admitted with respiratory symptoms and post uh, COVID uh, inflammation. Uh, so even if you see myocarditis, it's still much more beneficial giving the vaccine. You can save so much on hospitalizations. And uh, this is also, again, showing the benefit of uh, reducing hospitalization if you give the vaccine. OK, so even there is predicted cases of myocarditis on the right. On the left, you just save so much hospitalization uh, if, uh, if you give the vaccine. And in uh, Brazil alone, I think they reported more than 3,000 deaths of post-COVID uh, multisystem inflammation uh, in children. So post-COVID myocarditis and Kawasaki lac is much more serious than the post-vaccine. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions.